9 verses, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And it says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect, exiled of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. That's where I get the title from. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. Kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not know, now see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that it is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's just pray, shall we? Father, this morning, again, we come to this passage of scripture at the beginning of a new year. And as we've seen in the title this morning, A Living Hope, uh, that's what I feel we need to hear as we enter a new time, a new challenge, uh, a new day in which we are to serve you and uh, be about the Father's business. So this morning, Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will teach us as we are led by you in this letter from Peter. We just pray that we'll be encouraged to glorify your name in everything that we seek to do. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 And so we're going to look at this subject this morning, a living hope. Uh, I don't know if you've often heard this saying, but there's a saying that goes something like, where there's life, there's hope. Well, I believe this quote is, is, is partly true. And... Uh, while I think you can say that in general, I, I don't believe there's any guarantee of it being a certain thing. It's not the fact of life that I believe determines hope, but the faith of life. It's the faith of life that gives us this living hope. And depending on where you put your faith determines the hope you have in the future. You know, a Christian believer has a living hope, as we read in verse 3. Because his faith and hope are in God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. This living hope is a theme that runs through this first letter of Peter. But before we kind of look at what these verses talk about this morning, and uh, what they have to teach us, uh, I want us just to get acquainted with the man who wrote it. Uh, who did he write it to and the reason that prompted him to write it. Well, as you'll see at the beginning of this letter in some of your study Bibles, it was written in 62 to 63 AD. And he was writing from Rome during the reign of Emperor Nero. Now, again, I don't know if you're familiar with this leader at this particular time. This person, this man, was evil. He was a brutal, corrupt, murderous, and everything else you can put in those uh, comments, uh, type of leader who was leading the people at that time. One of the most evil leaders to ever live 
on the face of the earth. And so while Peter's writing this, he's got this in the back of his mind about this time that he's living in. And so this is what we need to find out about Peter writing this to the Christians of who he is. And verse 1 tells us that the writer is obviously Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So there's no doubts about who's putting pen to paper here. Notice it says Peter, an apostle. It doesn't say Peter, the first pope. Or Peter, the, the best apostle, or the chief apostle. Or, or Peter, the, the magnificent man that everybody in the world thinks he was. No, he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. The, the inference was on Jesus Christ, not on Peter, who was an apostle. You know, some scholars have questioned whether a common fisherman could have written this letter, especially since both Peter and John were called unschooled and ordinary men. In fact, in the book of Acts, um, I'll read this to you, I've not got these verses up here. In the book of Acts, chapter 4, and there's some verses that, that lead up to this, verse 18 through uh, to 13, it says this, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, now, there's a good key for us here. Filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? This was the story of Jesus healing the lame man. As Peter and John were going to pray in the temple, they met this lame man. And in the name of Jesus Christ, they, they prayed over him and he got healed. They didn't heal him, Jesus healed him. And they got hauled before the authorities because of that. And this is this little piece here that we're talking about. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, now that's boldness for you right there. He stood before the authorities and he's telling them, you've crucified Jesus. When God raised, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And then he goes on to say in verse 13, listen, I want you to listen to this. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Wow. Is that cool? They recognized that they'd been with Jesus. That they were filled with the Holy Spirit, been with Jesus. And now these two bold men, Peter and John, were proclaiming who Jesus Christ was in front of the authorities. What a great testimony that is. This is Peter, this man, who's written this, this letter to us uh, for us today so that we can gain insight into what he want to encourage us with. You know, we must never underestimate the training Peter had for three years alongside Jesus Christ. Was Jesus Christ the teacher. Nor should we ever minimize the work of the Holy Spirit in his life and ministry. As I read in that portion of scripture from Acts chapter 4, it said Peter full of the Holy Spirit. Many times it says Peter full of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we need to understand right now. That it's not about the qualifications of any particular person. It doesn't matter what somebody says they have on a piece of paper. Anybody could write anything on a piece of paper to say they have all kinds of qualifications. If they're not full of the Holy Spirit, it's only a piece of paper. I've heard so many times I've, I've got this degree and this earned degree and that earned degree. And I don't care who's earned it. It doesn't, it, it's fine. Those are things in life that you can do and they can get you places. That's okay. 
But when we're talking about the gospel, about evangelism, it's about the Holy Spirit. It's not what's written on a piece of paper that qualifies anybody to say what Jesus Christ has done in your life. And this is what got hold of Peter. This is who he was. Because if you remember before what happened to Jesus on the cross, P Peter was a, a very ordinary guy that has faults. In fact, somebody wrote, this is the apostle with the foot-shaped mouth. Because every time he opened his mouth, he put his foot in it. This was Peter. But after seeing Jesus resurrected, meeting him on the beach, looking him in the eye, and Jesus asking him, who do men say that I am? And, and Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then after Jesus has risen from the dead, he waited in the upper room. The Holy Spirit filled him along with all the others. Filled him. And it's this Peter who wrote this letter. It's this Peter now putting pen to paper. As we know, Peter's given name was uh, <coughs> excuse me, Simon, called Simon in, in the Bible as, as he's first introduced. But it was Jesus who changed it to Peter. Peter in the Aramaic is Cephas. In the Greek, it's Petros. The Greek word for Petros is a piece of rock, a stone. You know, we often hear Peter called us the rock, which is okay. I, I can kind of accept that. But the real translation of that word Petros is a piece of rock, a stone, or a pebble. And that's what we have to understand, that it's Peter, the part of a rock. The rock is Jesus Christ. It was the fact that Peter described Jesus Christ when he says, Who do men say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in the text it continues. Because Jesus then says, Upon that profession, I want to tell you that you are Peter. And upon the rock of your profession, of Jesus being the rock, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The rock of the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Not on Peter the first Pope. Not on any man. Not on any person. It's built on Jesus Christ. And that's where this man comes in. So Peter's ministry was to the Jews. And he was told to tend the flock. And this letter is part of, of that ministry. As he writes in verse, verse 1, To God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. These were the people he was writing to, believers in Jesus Christ. They were strangers because they were believers. Do you, do you realize people think if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're pretty strange? Are you okay with that? Amen. Some people are called aliens. I know what that, that sounds like. We're aliens. They call us aliens. I'm okay with that. Because in the Bible, that's what this word means. A stranger, an alien. Because in the world's eyes, if you're a Christian, you're somebody different. And I actually like that. Because if somebody can't see that you're different, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, there's something wrong. If they don't see you as somebody different, because of your faith, because you've now accepted Jesus Christ, there's something wrong. So these people were the ones he was writing to. And these were the people who were strangers, with a different standard from that of the world. And because of this, they were experiencing suffering, persecution, which led them to be scattered. That word scattered is used uh, with a word called diaspora which is technically the term for Jews who used to live in Jerusalem and now living because they're scattered outside of Jerusalem to different parts of Asia, which is now modern Turkey. And so this letter is to mainly Jews, but there were some Gentiles who also received this letter. And like I said right at the very beginning, the reason why Peter wrote this letter was to encourage 
those believers who were suffering. And as we'll see in a moment, he tells them that this suffering will one day be transformed into glory. We can see that in verse 7. And so Peter is preeminently the apostle of hope. And as believers, you and I should be in this environment of a living hope. Because we have a living hope when we put our trust in a living Savior. As we'll see in verse 3, it mentions grace. And, and we could talk about just that for, for the whole of the message. But this word grace, while it's used in verse 3, is, is used throughout First Peter. Because God's grace is, is generous, given to every single person. And, and that's something again that we see throughout this first letter. It's grace that gives us strength in times of trial. It's grace that saves us. It's grace that allows us to serve God in spite of difficulties. Whatever begins with God's grace will always lead us to a living hope. And so as we study First Peter, we'll see that throughout the the, the the letter will see the issue of suffering and grace and hope all intertwined. And they all unite to form an encouraging message for believers in these days which we're living in right now. If there's ever a day we need to have a living hope, it's in a day like today. And it's based on the grace and glory of God. So, in this first section, Peter shares some wonderful discoveries about the hope of God which becomes for you and I a living hope. So let's first of all see the first thing that Peter wants us to understand. We've read that first Acts in Corinthians. It's a living hope of salvation. A living hope of salvation. Look at verse 3 as we look at this together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ according to his great mercy he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's a living hope of salvation. That's the first thing. That's where we get our living hope from. We don't get it from anything else. Because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're back to that Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15 again. What is the gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's our living hope. Believers have been given new birth, which becomes our living hope, being born again. Again, we go back to that passage in, in John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 3. It talks about being born again of the Spirit. It's the only way that we, we can have a living hope. It's in our salvation because we know Jesus Christ. It's the only way to enter the glory of God. It's not works. It's not behavior. It's not belonging to a church. It's not giving. It's not doing all the good deeds that you can do and find to do. It's not anything belonging to a denomination of any kind. That's not what does it. That's not where salvation is birthed. It's birthed in the new birth of being born again. None of those things will allow us into the presence of God in heaven when we die. It's only in our faith in Jesus Christ. Again, you know, we come back to the biblical basic doctrines of faith time after time after time as we look at one letter to the next letter. Why do you think it's all in here? Because I believe God wants us to get it before we get to the point of death. He wants us to understand it. And so he'll talk about it through every opportunity that he gets. Whether that's through Matthew, Mark, Luke or John. Whether that's through Peter. Whether that's through any other writing in the New Testament that Paul has written. He wants us to get it. I don't want us to ever sit here thinking, oh, well, we're talking about the gospel again. We're talking about being born again, again. 
I want every single person under the sound of the preaching of the message to understand what it means to be born again. You know, I, I grew up for 30 years in Catholicism. I heard so many different things. I need to tell you, I never got any of it. I never got any of it. It didn't impact my life. I, I don't want believers in this time who say they believe in Jesus Christ to miss it. I want you to get it. And that's why we'll keep coming back to these very basic principles of faith. You know, you can go to all kinds of seminars and have all kinds of different things, like we're talking about, you know, unschooled people like Peter and John. And you can do all of those kind of amazing things. And don't get me wrong, some of those things that are good and beneficial. But if you don't get it at the end of it, it's all a waste of time. And so what we need to understand right now, the beginning of this new year, we have to understand the concept of being born again. And there's only one way that we can be born again, and it's through Jesus Christ. John's Gospel, chapter 14, <coughs> verse 6. We hear it many times. It's 14, 20, uh, number 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the answer. And if we grasp that this morning, we're making sure that we're children of the King. And as somebody once pointed out, when we make that decision, we're included in Christ's last will and testament. Is that pretty cool? That's the only one we need to be worried about. None of our relatives matter. It's all about Christ's last will and testament. And when that happens, we will share in his glory and his inheritance, which we're going to look at in a minute, because we have a living hope of salvation. Are you born again today? Have you asked Christ into your life? You have to do it. You can't do it on the back of your parents or anybody else. First, Peter wants us to understand we have a living hope of salvation. The second thing Peter wants us to discover this morning is a living hope of assurance. Look at verse 4. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. When you accept Christ into your life, your inheritance is kept in heaven, in heaven for you. That's the assurance that you have. That one day, when you pass from this earth, you're going to be in heaven for eternity. Whoever that is. It's kept in heaven for you. When you're born again of the Spirit, that inheritance is kept. Secure. That word kept is a military word that means guarded, shielded. In other words, nobody else can steal it. The tense of the verb reveals that we are constantly being guarded by God. He's guarding our inheritance, assuring us that one day we shall safely arrive in heaven because we're now in Christ. We're united with Him. And because of that, we have the assurance of our future inheritance. You know, there's so much emphasis on making sure that we have enough retirement. We have what it takes to take us out of this life. Our 401k has got to be huge. It's got to be this, it's got to be that. Now, again, don't hear me wrong. We need those things. But it's, it's not the focus of our attention. Because one day this life is going to end. And whatever that 401k is will make no difference where we end up after that point. We have to make sure now that we're comfortable when we eventually retire and all of these efforts that we're putting in now. I, I, I just felt, and we've, we've led a life, God's going to look after us, whatever happens. He's going to look after us. You know, I hear people say, I've, I've done this and I've done that and I've got this stock and I've got that stock and 
I, have, I only know chicken stock, that's all I know. <laughs> it tastes nice on chicken, doesn't it? Chicken stock. But we have to make sure that our assurance of salvation is kept for us in heaven. Nothing in life is assured. No matter how well we might have planned, the stock market could crash. Illness comes. Tragedies come. You need money for all kinds of things. But our living hope as believers gives you and I an assurance that can never be taken away by anything. Right. Nothing. Not circumstances, people, not even the devil and his demons cannot take that away from us. We have that assurance. Peter's third discovery about the hope of God, which becomes a living hope for you and I, is a living hope of power. Look at verse 5 and 6. It says this, Who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. A living hope of power. You know, everything happens in the here and now is a preparation for what God has in store for us in heaven. That's why I believe it explains the presence of trials in our lives. I believe they're some of God's tools and textbooks in the school of Christian experience. I don't know about you, but I felt a, as though I've been through God's boot camp many times. Yes. Many, many times. In the experiences of life and the trials of life. And that's what verse 6 is all about. Grief in all kinds of trials. It's part of being prepared for what is to come. You know, when life is going well, that's one thing. What happens when our world caves in? How strong is our faith in these times? But in verse 6 it tells us, though now for a little while, it's going to pass, one day it's going to pass. That's, that's the issue of whatever is happening right now. Because the good news is that we have power that comes from the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that God gave to the Apostles. To Peter to evangelize, to preach, to pray and perform miracles. You know, I, I'm not sure that most Christians realize that we possess the same power that the apostles had. That we can call on the power of the Holy Spirit just like they did. Why should it be any different? All the things that they had at their disposal as followers of Jesus Christ, we have. We have. I think in these days more than ever before, we need the power from above. And when we call on that power, which is the Holy Spirit, He promises that He will be with us. The Holy Spirit will be with us in the lion's den of illness. The Holy Spirit will be with us in the fiery furnace of death. The Holy Spirit will be with us on the stormy waters of unemployment and hardships and no money. I believe God wants us to behave like Christians who believe in a God who gives us the power to triumph over anything, and dare I say it, even the coronavirus. He gives us that power. There was sickness and illness from the beginning of time. I don't know about you, we, we don't have leprosy nowadays, but leprosy was rife in the time of Jesus. Jesus touched a leper. He didn't go up to a leper with a mask on. <laughs> no, seriously. I, I, I'm just trying to... You know, we're believers in Jesus Christ. I know where I'm going if anything happens to me. Amen. We only have a certain time left. 
I've been, again, I've been thinking about this coming into the new year. The devil's very crafty. Just even institutions that normally have the word of God that goes into them cannot have it because of this virus. Prisons. That's, that was part of my ministry growing up as a new Christian. Went into the prisons to, to, to spread the word of God, to preach, to sing. Evangelists can't go in prison because of this. There's men in prison who would give their lives to Jesus Christ if the evangelists would be allowed to go in. But because of this virus, they can't go in. Nursing homes. We used to be able to go into nursing homes and evangelize and go visit, do all the things. Can you imagine in the last days of people's lives, they're not now hearing the gospel. It might have been the last time they get to hear the word of God. But the devil's closed it down. I believe he's closing these ministries down. God wants you and I to step up. I, I, I know I get it with, with certain things in people's lives. I get it. But I just want us to be bold. I just, just rely on the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. He was with the apostles in those days. And here's the bottom line. He was with them and miracles happened. At the end of the day, they all died. They still all died. Every single one of them, apart from John, was martyred or murdered. So at the end of the day, they're going to be with Jesus. But they can never stand before Jesus and say, You hid away from me. You didn't do what I asked you to do. I don't want to be guilty of that. I don't want any of us to be guilty of that. Whatever opportunity God gives us, I believe we have a living hope of power. Final discovery of Peter about the hope of God, which becomes for us a living hope for you and I, is a living hope of joy. Verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Again, that's something we're probably thinking right now. There's, there's not much to be joyful about. You mean you expect me to be joyful when the world is in a mess right now? The word of God says, yes, we do. We do have that joy because of the living hope that we have. You mean you want me to be joyful when my business is gone and, and I'm finding it difficult to pay my mortgage? Yes, all of these things and more are consuming our lives. But what Peter has been trying to do at the beginning of this letter is to shift our focus from us, from me, from it, from this, from the here and now and get us to fix our attention on a living hope that takes our eyes from down here to up there. Amen. And he wants us to do that. And when we do that, it'll bring us joy. For me to think about what is up there and what's going to be, for me, brings inexpressible joy. And even though we've not seen Jesus, he says we can rejoice with inexpressible joy. You know, I, I've said it before from here, there are too many miserable Christians. <laughs> it's all doom and gloom. And, and I, for one, I, I, I don't flourish around miserable people. I don't. <laughs> you know, you often hear people talk about their lives being a series of mountains and valleys and mountains and valleys and uh, good days and bad days and uh, all, all the doom and gloom that comes with all of that. Here's what I feel that a Christian should be focused on. I believe God wants us to look and live life through the eyes of faith. And he wants us to see only two mountain peaks. Okay? Mount Calvary, where Jesus suffered and died and rose again, and the Mount of Olives where he's going to return in glory. Amen. Two mountain peaks. We looked at this in our Bible study. 
And depending on how you look at the mountain peaks, you will see the victory in both of those and not the valley in between. If you look at the mountain peaks like that, you only see the mountain peaks. But if you look at it from the side, you will see the valley, which is all the doom and gloom and all the woes that go on down there. But if we look at what took place on Calvary, where Jesus suffered and died, and then look at where Jesus is coming back to, the Mount of Olives, where he's going to touch down, and he's going to reign for a thousand years. Then for you and I, that's where our living hope of joy comes from. I want us to realize that we have a living hope of salvation, a living hope of assurance, a living hope of power, and a living hope of joy. And we can experience it right now. You know, whatever this year brings, whether it's better than last year or worse than last year, as Peter was encouraging the believers in 62 AD to a living hope, I believe he's encouraging Freedom Christian Church in 2021, 2021 to the same living hope. And that living hope can be found in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's act like we have a living hope and be effective for Jesus this new year. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, shall we?